If this is your first time using the Knit Collection, let me show you how to find the plugins along with some basics on using them. Let's start with how to access them from Lightroom Classic, Photoshop, Lightroom CC, sort of, Affinity Photo, and of course, DxO Photo Lab. I'll also show you how to use the collection if you're not using any of the supported host applications. We'll start in Lightroom Classic. There's two different ways to get there. From the photo menu, go to Edit In, and then choose any of the plugins, or simply right-click on the photo, choose Edit In, and access the plugin here. You'll also notice there's an option called Open as Smart Object in Photoshop. This will give you the ultimate flexibility in editing your photos, and we'll talk more about that later. For now, I'm just going to go ahead and open this up in Nick 8 Color Effects. You're presented with this dialog here, asking you what you want to edit. The only option available now is Edit a Copy with Lightroom Adjustments. That's because this is a raw photo, and so before I can edit it, it's going to have to be rendered out as a TIFF or JPEG file so that you can edit it in the Nick Collection. If, however, you are opening a TIFF or JPEG, you'd be able to choose from these options here, and we'll see those again in just a moment. Down here, you have the copy file options, asking what format and what bit depth you want to edit in. TIFF and 16-bit is pretty much always recommended. When you click on Edit, Lightroom's going to render out that TIFF file and open it up in Analog Effects. I'm just going to apply a quick preset here, this black and white one, and then click Apply. But before I do, I want you to see this one very important option here, Non-Destructive Edits. If I select that, the Nick Collection will render out a layered TIFF file. That layered TIFF file means that I have both my original image and the altered one on top of it, and the metadata explaining what happened to that image hidden in the file as well. This means that I'll actually be able to go back in and re-edit that file later if I want to. I'm going to go ahead and leave it on, even though it does say that it will be a larger file. When I click Apply, this will render back into Lightroom Classic, and we'll see the altered image right next to the original. Now if I go to that altered image, and I right-click on it, and choose Edit In, Analog Effects again, now I have additional options. I can edit a copy, duplicating the file that I have and picking up where I left off, or editing the original. In this case, the original, of course, is that TIFF file, which is a layered TIFF file, which means once it opens up, all the edits that I previously applied are here waiting for me, and if I make a change to another preset, like one of these color ones, the color comes back, telling us that we are in fact working from that original TIFF file that we created from the RAW. And this, of course, is because I ticked that checkbox to make non-destructive edits, to make a bigger file, but to be able to come back to it at any time. I'll cancel out of here, and let's go over to Photoshop next. In Photoshop, once again, there's a couple ways to get to the plugins. I can go to the Filter menu, and then Nick Collection 8, and choose the filter from here, or I can access it from the toolbar over here on the right. Now, if you don't see these floating palettes, the way you access those is by going to the Plugins menu, Nick Collection 8, and accessing one of them here. I recommend you start with Preferences, which is going to open up this dialog here, which at first may just be a floating palette. But with the floating palette, you can simply drag it over to the toolbar and dock it into place. And then when you click on it, it opens up, click it again to make it disappear. Within the preferences, there's some really important options in here that you definitely want to understand before working with these files. Now, I encourage you to watch the dedicated Photoshop video in this tutorial series, as all of these important details about using Photoshop are covered in there, including how to integrate Photoshop masks and AI masking within the Nick collection. Now that you know how to get to the plugins in Photoshop, I don't really need to show you anything else in here, except I will expand on the benefits of that menu option that we saw back in Lightroom Classic to open the image as a Photoshop Smart Object instead of opening it directly in the plugin. If you choose that option, Lightroom will create a Photoshop file and manage it from within Lightroom, so you can access the image right alongside your original photos, so there's no additional file management needed, but the big advantage of this is that by opening the photo as a Smart Object in Photoshop, all of the NIC filters act as Smart Filters, meaning that they are completely non-destructive and can be re-edited at any time. In fact, even the original RAW file will still be RAW and can be opened in Camera RAW and edited at the RAW level as if you were still in Lightroom. It does make for larger files, but again, it is the ultimate in flexibility. Next, let's look at Lightroom CC. Unfortunately, there is no plugin architecture inside of Lightroom CC, so the only option you have is to edit in Photoshop. And you can edit it straight in Photoshop by rendering it out as a TIFF file or opening it as a smart object so you gain all the benefits that we just talked about. If you're subscribed to the Adobe Photography Bundle, then you already have access to Photoshop alongside of Lightroom, and so you can access the plugins through there. 
If you don't have that bundle though, and you don't have access to Photoshop, then your other solution is to render out a TIFF file and open that in the plugins directly, which we'll see in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at how to get to it in Affinity Photo. In Affinity Photo, access the plugins from the Filters menu, Plugins, Knit Collection 8, and there you have them all. Now, unfortunately, Affinity Photo doesn't have access to the layered TIFF file or the non-destructive workflow. For that, you'll need to use the other host, but you can access the plugins within Affinity Photo and render them destructively back to the file. If you're gonna do that, it's probably a good idea to duplicate the layer first and then edit it. Now that I've launched Analog Effects, if I choose a preset and then click Apply, you'll see that's gonna render right back into Affinity Photo, but since I didn't duplicate the layer first, that original photo layer has been overwritten. So again, duplicating the layer first is definitely a good practice. Next, let's look at Photolab. To access the filters in Photolab, there's a dedicated NIC collection button, which once clicked, presents you with the plugin selector. You can choose your plugin from here, and just like in Lightroom, you have a settings option to choose what type of file you're gonna send over. Once again, sending over a TIFF file in 16-bit is highly recommended. Choose your plugin, I'll use SilverFX this time, and you'll see that Photolab renders out that new TIFF file and then opens it in the plugin. I'll just grab one of these presets for now, and once again, notice down here in the bottom right, that you have access to the non-destructive edits option within Photolab as well. I'll click apply, that'll render the image back to Photolab, and we'll see it sitting next to the original one right here. Finally, if you aren't using any of these host tools, you can still use the Knit Collection simply by opening the plugin just like any other app, and then simply opening the image file. Note that you can't open a raw file in the Knit Collection as it's not a raw processor. So you'll need to develop the raw photo first in whatever raw editor you're using, such as Capture One, then export that as a TIFF or JPEG and open it in the Knit Collection app like this. I'll jump over to the Finder where I have the Knit Collection 8 folder open from the Applications folder and I'll launch one of them, let's say Analog Effects. When you launch it directly, You'll see that there's no image open, but in the middle it says drag and drop your picture here or use Commando to open. Again, a common workflow would be to render out a TIFF file from your host app and then open it here. But if you have an app that supports drag and drop, you might be able to do that as well. Check this out. I'm gonna switch over to Apple Photos and just take a picture from here and drag and drop it into Analog Effects. Now I have access to all the different filters in here, just like I would for any other photo, and I can do whatever I want to my image. When you're done editing your photo, you'll notice that the button that used to say apply now simply says save preset. So if you've made a custom look, you can save that as a preset, but more importantly, to actually save your file, it's a little bit different. Go up here to the top right and click on export as TIFF. Where that TIFF is saved is gonna be set in the preferences. Then once you've exported that TIFF file, you can import that back into your host application if you want to. That's all the different ways that you can access the Knit Collection. There are a series of other videos in this tutorial section that dive deep into specific features, but I do want to give you a fairly high-level overview of how the plugins actually work. There are several in the Knit Collection, and some have unique workflows. However, the majority of them, including Analog Effects, Color Effects, and Silver Effects, follow the same basic process. So let's have a quick tour using Color Effects as the example. On the left-hand side, you'll find a collection of presets. Lots and lots of different presets giving you an idea of what the app can do. And what's really special about these presets is you'll notice that each one of these has an icon represented from your original image. The software quickly develops your image with each preset so you can get an idea of what it's gonna look like before you even select it. The presets are organized up at the top in categories, but we're right now looking at all of them. You may have noticed over on the right-hand side that as I selected each individual preset, all the different filters over there changed. Each preset is made up of a variety of different filters and the filters that we need show up over here. As I choose another preset, those filters are replaced with whatever's needed to make that look. If I wanna revert my image back to where I started, I can go to the history panel and click on original image to see that. And you'll notice now that I have, the filter list is empty because I haven't applied anything to it. If I wanna build a custom look, I can do that by going to the individual filters. And as you can see here, there's a lot of them. To add a filter, simply click on it and that'll add it to the stack. So I've just added this black and white conversion and obviously the image is now black and white. Now I'll add a second filter on top of that. I can scroll through here to find one or I can select one of the favorites that I've previously marked by clicking on the star here or I can search for it. I'll go up here to search, type in color and there's the one that I want, by color. Now here's an important point about working with your filters. If I click on by colors filters right now, it's actually going to replace black and white conversion. 
watch. I click on that and it replaces the black and white one. Well, that's not what I wanted. So I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that. And now instead of clicking on the filter to replace the existing one, I'll click on the plus to add that filter. Now I've added that bicolor filter after the black and white conversion. Now here's another very important point about color effects in the Knit Collection. The order of the filters matters. In this case, I made the image black and white and then added color on top of it. But if I take that color filter and I drag it before black and white, well, now the image is back to just black and white because I added color first and then converted that to black and white. So the order very much matters in which you apply things. It'll give you different looks and different effects depending on what you've done. To remove any individual filter from the list, just click on the little X next to it and it goes away. Each filter has a variety of sliders on it, just depending on what that filter is, but almost every filter at the bottom has something called local adjustments. This is where one of the most powerful features of the Knit Collection lives. The Knit Collection is the birthplace of control point technology. Now, I'm not gonna dive into the technicalities of how all these work, but this local adjustments palette is where you can choose just what portions of the image are being affected. I'll start with a basic control point and add that to the sky. Now, as I stretch this out, we can see that that is affecting that portion of the sky in there. And if we want to know exactly what it's affecting, I can click on this little mask icon here and we can see what part of the image is being masked out. Now, this is not just a radial gradient. This is a control point. And as I drag this around the scene, you'll see that it builds a mask based off of whatever I'm pointing at. So if I primarily wanted to affect the land and the buildings there, I could reposition this control point just around the buildings, ensure that I've got just the right area selected, Hide the mask, and there's the effect. Now, as I go through the different color sets in here, you'll see that that filter is applying just that landmass at the back. There's a ton more to the Knit Collection, but that should be enough to get you started. Again, I encourage you to watch the rest of the tutorials in this series, as well as videos from previous versions, as the Knit Collection has been in development for over 30 years now. So there's a ton of wonderful videos about using it all over the internet. Enjoy.